So Jesus is the centerpiece of the kingdom. Amen. He is the king of the kingdom. He is the judge, the ruler, the propitiation, the sacrifice, the advocate. He is everything. The Bible says by him all things were made and nothing was made that was not made through him. Amen. He is the fullness of the Godhead. Jesus is not the second person in the Trinity. Amen. The word is the second person in the Trinity. The Bible tells us Jesus is the embodiment of father, word and spirit in a man. Amen. So when you study Jesus, you need to take some time to clear your glasses. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Say clear your glasses. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Say clear your glasses. Say it with some life this morning. Amen. Clear your glasses. So I want to just take a subset of Jesus now from the book of Hebrews. I want to show us Jesus as a high priest. Amen. So we're going to take a journey, right? Right? Amen. Come with me to the book of Hebrews. Paul, thank you. Now, I'm not going to read one text this morning because we're going to go through a lot of texts, if that's okay by you. So, we're just going to jump around the book of Hebrews. And I want to talk to you about the personality of Jesus as your high priest. Why is it so important to understand Jesus as a high priest? It is so important to understand Jesus as a high priest, especially, well, for many issues. But one of the most important aspects of Christianity in which his priesthood must be appreciated is in the place of prayer. Look at your name. Say prayer. prayer. Say prayer. Now, prayer is not the thing you do for 10 minutes in the morning to get God off your case for the rest of the day. Prayer is not your get out of jail card that you pull out when you're in a fix. Prayer is not what you do when you come to church on a Sunday or a Thursday, you know, just so you can feel good about it. Prayer is an integral life source of the kingdom. Prayer is your access to the life of the kingdom. There are many types of prayer. There is the prayer of request, which we all know, petition, supplication, adoration, you know, uh, uh, exaltation, intercession. You know, prayer takes many different ways and forms. Prayer simply, by my definition, is the interaction between the natural realm and the spirit realm. Can I say that again? Prayer is anything that brings the spirit realm to bear on the natural and prayer doesn't always, or prayer does not end with talking to God. Amen? Stay with me. Prayer is not limited to talking to God. In fact, some of the most effective forms of prayer are not directed at God. Some of you are looking at me and say, God, this is, this is what, what is he talking about this morning? Let me help you out. God is spirit, right? Not a spirit, he is spirit. But beyond God, there are other spirits. And some of the most effective forms of prayer you will ever say are not addressed to God. For instance, you don't need to address God when you are faced with a demonic situation. Because the Bible says he has given you power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and of every power of the enemy, right? So there's no point, there's no sense in talking to God and saying, God, please, there's this demon that's messing up in my house. It's moving my furniture around. You take authority over the spirit and you bind it and you cast it out. Amen, because you have received authority. Now, that is prayer, but it is not necessarily directed at God. True? True? Okay, let me help some of you out. When you look through the Bible at the Gospels, Jesus being our example, right? When you look through the example in Scripture, not every time Jesus prayed did he address the Father. There were some situations in which he said, Father, I thank you. For instance, a Lazarus tomb. Jesus did not say, Lord, please raise Lazarus from the dead. He said, Father, I thank you because you have heard me and you always hear me. But could you please just make it clear to these people that you hear me? Then he stopped talking to God. He got God involved. He showed God what God had to gain by the situation. And then he said, God, thank you. Then he spoke to death. Amen. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, that was a prayer. He was engaging a spiritual force, just that the spiritual force wasn't God. If you don't understand Jesus as your high priest, prayer becomes either boring or ineffective, or usually both. In fact, one of the reasons why we don't get the results in prayer we seek to get and therefore get frustrated and give up is because we miss the fundamental perspective that prayer must be based on Jesus as our high priest. 
Amen. Let me talk to you about the high priest first of all, before I go into the book of Hebrews. Now, many years, many thousands of years ago, after God destroyed the earth by a flood and then rebuilt it through Noah, in fact, from the very Garden of Eden, from the minute man fell, God had always been seeking to be able to relate with humanity. The problem was he is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. So he had a problem. God had a conundrum. The thing he loved most was intertwined with the thing he hated most. Anybody ever felt like that about people before? <laughs> you know, you love your brother, but you can't stand his wife. But the Bible says they are one. Amen. You love your wife, but her mother, bless God. Now, God had a situation. His most prized creation, man, had become one with his most, advers with his most hated foe, sin. You see, God doesn't hate the devil. He just hates sin. God is love. Amen. God doesn't, God, does, God doesn't have a problem with Satan as a person. He has a problem with what he stands for. And so God saw man and sin as one body and said, I have an issue here. How do I separate between the one I love and the one I can't stand? So he, 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 the Bible talks about Christ being the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. Now I've explained this before. The word world there is the word cosmos. In Greek, in the Septuagint, in Greek, it's cosmos. It doesn't mean the physical earth. It means the systems that govern the kingdoms of the earth. Are you with me? When the Bible says, go you into all the world, it doesn't, say go, it, it doesn't just mean go into the geography. It means go into the systems of the world, go into banking and politics, go into media and academics, go into finance and sports, go into the systems that the... Si Think of it this way. The word cosmopolitan comes from the word cosmos. When you hear cosmopolitan, what do you think? Think of a city, right? So the systems that govern human arrangement are the cosmos. The Bible says Christ was the lamb seen from the foundations of the world. What was the foundations of the world? The foundations of the world was when Adam fell and sinned and Satan took authority and control and be God, the Bible says, of this world. He's not the God of the earth. Uh, I want to get to the high priest, but let's, let, let's dance around for a while. Satan is not the God of the earth. The Bible says the earth is the and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein. Right? So the physical thing we see belongs to God. But behind the physical structure, behind the earth, behind the people, there is a system of governance that has succeeded in subverting humanity. It's called the world. And of that world, Satan is the God. He controls music, he controls politics, he controls the financial sector, he controls education these days. That's why our children are told that they have to believe God doesn't exist to do a course in theology. See how far we've come. He controls media, he controls Hollywood. These are the systems of the world. Now, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, God was showing the pattern that for me to relate with you, I have always wanted to be Emmanuel. Jesus was just the fulfillment of the concept of Emmanuel. God always wanted to dwell among his people. The problem was he had to figure a way to do it. So he kills the lamb, the Bible calls that lamb Jesus, clothes Adam and Eve with the skin, and the blood of that lamb becomes the propitiation for their sin. But notice, somebody has to kill the lamb on their behalf. Are you with me? God has to step in. That's the first manifestation of the high priest in the Bible. Yahweh, the father himself, comes down to the earth, takes an animal, kills the animal, makes a sacrifice on behalf of fallen man. And because of his action, fallen man has a right to relate to God. Are you with me? And then through the ages, you see fathers and, and, and men of the household being the priest in their own house and making sacrifices and blessing their children and all that stuff. And then you come to Israel. God says, you know what now? I need to show the world how to relate with me. I need to raise out a people who can be an example to the rest of the world, who can lead the nations back to me. So he chooses Abraham because Abraham is a man of faith. Abraham believes in God. Abraham is ready to put his life on the line for God. And God said, I'm going to raise a seed from you. And through that seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In the book of Exodus chapter 18, God tells Israelites, I want to make you a kingdom of priests. Now, Israel missed it. 
the law God gave them was not to exclude everybody else. It was to be an example to everybody else. In fact, the Bible calls Israel in the New Testament, the church in the wilderness, the ecclesia, the called out people, the ones who are supposed to show the way to everybody else. But they thought because they received the law, they were so special, nobody else mattered. Now, in those times, Israel's law or culture was the only culture you could obey and follow and still glorify God. Can I say that again? The law of the Israelites, their way of life, was the only culture you could obey and give God glory. God was trying to show the world how their culture or their way of life, their rules, the, the things that govern their existence had to be in alignment with his will. So the Ten Commandments are not just instructions God gave. They're his personality revealed. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God is a God of covenant. Amen. God is saying, I don't commit adultery. I was faithful to my wife, Israel. Christ was faithful to his wife, the church. You must be faithful to your wife. Amen. Thou shalt not lie. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, or chapter 43, I am the Lord, sorry, chapter, no, so, no, 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 no. No, not 43. I'm coming down in a second. When it says you must forgive, thou shalt not, or, or you, when the Bible tells us not to hold malice and hold grudges and you know, not, to, not to harbor hatred against our brothers. In Isaiah 43, God says, I am the Lord your God who forgives your iniquity. And for my sake, I remember them no more. So the only reason I want you to forgive is because it's my nature to forgive. The Bible says the Holy One of Israel cannot lie. It is outside. If God would not, if God tried to lie, he'd fail. Amen? And so the instructions he gives us or he gave them were his way of expressing his nature to them. Are you with me? Are you with me so far? But now let's get back to the high priest. So in the process of trying to bring man back to a relationship with God, he, he institutes the order of priesthood. Somebody say priesthood. priesthood. Now, a priest is the custodian of an altar. Somebody say custodian of an altar. An altar is a place. Notice how close this definition is to my definition of prayer. An altar is a place where the spirit realm meets the natural realm. Can you start to connect the dots? An altar is any place where the two realms converge. And it's not always godly. I grew up in a country where you would see fetish altars on the road at 5 a.m. in the morning. An altar is a place where somebody, a custodian of the altar, the priest, conjures up a spiritual power, right? Or relates with a spiritual power to give that spiritual power access to the affairs of man. Can I say that again? An altar is a place where a priest or a custodian or a group of custodians invoke a spiritual power to give that spiritual power access into the activities of men. Why does a spiritual power need an altar and a priest? Because when God created the world, he told Adam, you have dominion over it. God gave authority over the world to man. If your friends ask you why God allows horrible things to happen, tell them he doesn't. If anybody ever asks you if God is so loving, why do people die? Tell them God has nothing to do with it. You know, when I was going up, I heard people say some very, very silly things. And we believe them because we were, we were not so wise. You have the saying, what will be, will be God is in control. Anything that happens is God's will. That's a lie from the deepest pit of the deepest hell. It's a lie from the deepest pit of the deepest hell. God is not in control of everything. Now, God has authority over everything, but in his authority and his sovereignty, he has ceded control to man concerning some things. If God was in control of everything, you couldn't prosecute a rapist. If he was in control of everything, you couldn't, you, 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 I mean, you couldn't convict a murderer. The Bible says it is not his will that any should perish, but people perish every day. True? Yeah. True? Yeah. In fact, I submit to you that more times than not on the earth today, the will of God is not done. Because he has given man a form of autonomy. There is a difference between independence and autonomy. Independence means you don't answer to anybody. Autonomy means you have a boss, but he's given you the right of decisions for him not to interfere. So, the United Kingdom is independent. Monaco in France is autonomous. They're still part of France, but they have their own set of rules and way of doing things. They have their own tax system. They have been given a break 
from the interference of the higher power. Man is not independent of God, but man was given autonomy. Are you with me? And so for a spiritual reality to have access in the realm of men, it must have a priest. Somebody say a priest. priest. Say priest. priest. For a spiritual power to be able to operate in the, in the realm of man, it must have a priest. There must be a human being who gives that spiritual power, license to function in the earth realm, which is why Miles Monroe defined prayer as earthly license for heavenly intervention. The Bible says that God says, I will do nothing in the earth unless I first reveal it to my servants, the prophet. Whenever God wants to do something in the earth, he finds a man he can inform and then use. The enemy works the same way. That's why we have witches and wizards and warlocks and freemasons and occultic practitioners. Satan needs human vessels to conduct his activity on the earth. Are you with me? The Bible says in Hebrews concerning Jesus, a body have I prepared for you. There is a reason that great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the what? In the flesh. God had to come through the vessel of a human being to have full access to change the system on the earth because that was the rule he made. Now, a priest is simply a human being that connects the two realms. Somebody who gives license for spiritual power to influence the affairs of men. Whenever you see a spiritual phenomenon on the earth, there is a priest behind it. Can I say that again? Wherever you see the release of a spiritual phenomenon, there is a priest and an altar behind that phenomenon. Whenever you see an earthquake or, or a whirlwind or, or a tornado that does not make sense, you know some of them don't make sense. There's some you could, they track them from where they start. In fact, every natural disaster simply is a spiritual phenomenon. Let's just, let's just, let's just make that very clear. You know, the earth doesn't just decide to vibrate. I know what science tells us about cracks and fault lines. But how did the cracks and fault lines get there in the first place? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Do you think God made the earth with cracks and fault lines? Tornadoes are areas of high pressure and low pressure. There are areas of high pressure and low pressure in this room right now, but we don't have a tornado. Like I said a few weeks ago, there's no such thing as a non-living thing in the realm of, 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 the, of the universe. Everything in the universe is alive. The Bible shows men talking to the sun, talking to the ground, talking to the wind, right? Talking to the night. Everything God created has a voice because there is a spiritual reality behind it. A few years ago, there was a hurricane sweeping through America and it was about to pass through this small town. And a group of Christians got together and they rebuked the thing. They said, you don't come here. And the thing went away. Does that sound like a non-living thing to you? Wherever you see a natural phenomenon, there is a priest behind it. And you must understand the priest and how he functions to get the benefit of the natural phenomenon or the supernatural phenomenon. So in those days, the Israelites had a high priest. God instituted the high priest. Now, this priest, first of all, was called to be the link between God and man. Right? He was called to be the people's representative to God. So whenever a person sinned, they would come to the priest and he would make a sacrifice for them. And based on him making, not them, this is the, this is the principle now. Whenever you sinned, you came to your priest. And based on his relationship, now this is the same reality that we've perverted in the New Testament. Because pastors are now being treated as high priests. Pastor, come and pray for me. If my pastor can just lay hands on me. No, no, no. Now we all have the same high priest. But then, not based on your relationship with God, based on the priest's relationship with God, you would come to the priest, and the priest would make a sacrifice for you. And if God accepted the priest's sacrifice, he would accept you. Did you get that? So once a year, the high priest would dress in a certain way. I, I wish I had time to go into his dressing because his dressing is very symbolic. He, he'd wear a, a mitre on his head. He'd wear a breastplate, an ephod symbolizing the righteousness of God. He'd wear stones symbolizing the children of Israel. And he had two stones called Urim and Thummim, prophetic stones close to his heart that gave him discernment on certain issues. So he knew the heart of God for his people. And he would come and prepare a sacrifice once a year on the Day of Atonement. And if God accepted the sacrifice, the whole of Israel were free for the next year. They would enjoy what, what the, the, the Jews call the blessings of the atonement. 
Now, if God was not happy with his sacrifice, he would be killed. And if that happened, Israel knew they were in trouble for one year. But the reality is, he was their representative before God. When God saw him, he saw the whole nation, right? God will deal with the entire nation based on his relationship with the priest. Are you getting my point? In fact, the Bible says that when God made the tabernacle, I was talking about Emmanuel, eventually from the Garden of Eden, God decided the way to become Emmanuel among his people for the first time was to build a tabernacle and for this tabernacle to be the place where his presence and glory would dwell. And when the Israelites wanted to relate with him, they would come there. Now, in the tabernacle, there was an outer court. I don't have time. Many of you know the story. There was an inner court and there was the Holy of Holies. Now, in the Holy of Holies, in a place behind a veil, there was something called the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence and the glory of God. And God said, there I will meet with you, meaning there I will encounter you, and there I will commune with you. Somebody say meet with and commune with. Many of us meet with God. Few of us commune with him. Your worship and the goosebumps start to hit. Shana Makosa. Oh, God is in this place. Amen. In Jesus' name, we close. But beyond meeting, God said, I want to commune with you. I want to have conversations. I want to have a heart exchange. But it only will happen at the ark. Surprise, surprise. Only one man was allowed to go into that place. The high priest. And so all the communing and all the relationship that God wanted to have with his people was done by one man right and based on how god dealt with the man god would deal with the people are you with me there's some interesting laws concerning the high priest which i don't have time to go into but one law i want to tell you about was this in the bible now if you killed someone accidentally in the bible in israel's day you had to run away to a city of refuge because the person's family were allowed to kill you to take revenge. Now the law says that if you ran to the city of refuge, the avenger could not come and kill you there. And you had to stay there because if you came out of the city and the avenger caught you, he could kill you. Interestingly, it said every time the high priest died, you were allowed to leave. So if you killed someone, accidentally and you ran away to save your life the minute the high priest the current high priest died you were free are you, are you drawing some interesting parallels but now let's go now that we have a background let's go to hebrew so please keep that principle in your mind that it is a situation of god deals with one man on behalf of the people right hebrews chapter 2 okay let's start from verse 17 Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, in all things, he had, now he is in capital letters, if you have a Bible that capitalizes like the New King James. So we're talking about Jesus here. If you read the rest of the chapter, you get some context. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Somebody say merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make propitiation for the sins of the people for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he's able to aid those who are tempted therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren now the bible tells us here that jesus had to be made like us so he could fulfill his office as a high priest. Now, what is the office of a high priest? It means that one person is the custodian of an altar that releases the influence of the spirit behind that altar over the people who the altar affects, right? It means that spiritual principality deals with the people as though they were the high priest. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus is has been made a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. So the first thing we understand is Jesus is a high priest primarily or exclusively to God, which is good news. Tell anybody that's good news. He's not a fetish high priest. He's not a high priest for, for principality or power or demon. He's a high priest of things pertaining to God. What it means is that if we are going to come into the things that pertain to God, 
We have only one access. This is why the Bible says that there is only one name. Now, the word name there doesn't mean J-E-S-U-S. -S. It means when you say stop in the name of the law, what do you mean? In the authority of the law, right? In the personality of the law. So basically, it's as if the law itself is talking to you. There is only one authority. There is only one, one, one jurisdiction under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You see, that's why, I, I, you know, and it aches my heart when I see people who are very, very good people, loving people, kind people, a lot more godly than most Christians. And people ask me, are you saying they won't get to heaven? I didn't say so. God did. Amen. There is only one high priest in the things pertaining to God. I was listening to TBN the other day, and this pastor was saying that, well, you know, even people that are idol worshippers, when they, when they do certain things, you know, they just don't understand, but it's all going to God. I said, excuse me. And then, you know, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, you know, they just don't understand, but, you know, even when they, when they praise their God, there's only one God up there, so God still gets the glory. I said, excuse you. God ain't getting no glory from that. You know why? Because they have a different priest. And whenever a priest takes things from people, he takes it back to his God. So Buddha is a priest. Hindu is a priest. Amen? Mohammed is a priest. All these, oh, it's quiet now. I, I, I'm a troublemaker. It's cool. Let's go. You can play this tape on, 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 on YouTube. I don't care. Give them my address and my phone number as well. These are all priests. And there is no way Buddha is taking praise and taking it to Jehovah. There's absolutely no way. Allah is taking any praise and giving it to Jehovah. No, 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 no. There is only one priest. You must get that in your mind. When you come to God, now the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. He's a coming of God must first believe that he is and he's a rewarder, right? So we say when we pray, we need faith. Faith in whom? Who is that faith in? Not God, the Father, Jesus. You know why? Because he is the priest. He is the only access point to God. So you cannot come to God in any way, shape, or form, any prayer, any supplication. Even the prayer of salvation is predicated on faith in Christ. Are you understanding me? Because he is the only priest of things pertaining to God. I'm teaching this morning. Can you handle it? There's no gymnastics this morning. Can you handle boring but simple truths? Yes. Foundational truths. If, see, let, let's look at this again. Let's, let's, let's look at this again. Let's, let me beat you with this till you get it. You know, sometimes you say Hebrew and Greek, sometimes you just read the Bible as it is. Let's read it as it is. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. In the things pertaining to. First Peter says all things pertaining to life and have been given to. Why don't we have them? Because they've been given to us in the custodian or in the custody of a priest. Are you with me? All things pertaining to life and godliness have been released from the throne of God, but they were given to our priest. And the same way when the priest came out of the presence of God, he was supposed to bless the people and release the power and the presence of God upon the people for the next year. We have a high priest, the Bible says, that has passed through the heavens. So when he comes out, he has our stuff, but we want to bypass him. Give me my breakthrough. Give me my husband. Give me my wife. Give me my Cadillac. Give me my Escalade. You know? Give me my stuff. But there is one priest. You don't get this, do you? Even in prayer, prayer is a theme pertaining to God, isn't it? Fasting is a theme pertaining to God. Giving is a theme pertaining to God. Amen? Everything that pertains to God has one custodian. And if you must go to God, you must understand that you are only as accessible to God as you are to Christ. He is the high priest pertaining to God, or to, or in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, this is the first job of a high priest, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Are you with me? The reason, oh, I might as well just jump to the end and come back to the beginning. When the Bible says we are to pray in the name of Jesus, it means we are to pray in the person of Jesus. You know why? Because only one man has access to the Holy of Holies. 
the high priest. So the only way we have access to the presence and the power of God is if we come as Christ. What the Bible says, we should put on Christ, put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Right. Say, oh, look, let's, let's look at the armor of God. Helmet of. Helmet of. Breastplate of. Feature with preparation of the gospel of. Sword of the. Shield of. I'm missing one. Belt of. Okay. Who does the Bible say our salvation is? Who does the Bible call our salvation? Who is the author and finisher of your faith? Who is the prince of peace? Who is the word, the sword of the spirit? Who, come on. Who is the way, the truth, and the... So when you put on the armor of God, what are you doing? Put on Christ. Like Esau put on, or Jacob put on Esau, and his father felt him and said, okay, you look like Esau. Because you appear in my presence like Esau, I will give you the blessing of Esau. The same way we are, the Bible calls him the first among many brethren. We are the younger brother. He is the older brother. When we go to God in prayer, God only answers prayers prayed by Christ. Let me just say that again. God only ever deals with one person in the realm of the spirit. His name is Jesus. If you don't come as Jesus, you ain't getting nothing. It's a good place to clap. If you don't come as Jesus, let me say this. If when you show up in the spirit realm, if you show up as Samantha, like they say where I come from, you've missed the road. If you show up as Pastor Illuminate, it's even worse. When we pray in the name, we're not just signing with the name in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. What we're saying is, Lord, I am coming in the authority, in the person, in the will. That's why the Bible says every prayer prayed in his name must be answered. Because you cannot pray in somebody's name out of their will. If you're going to wield the authority of the Queen of England as a police officer, you must wield it within the confines of her will. The minute you take yourself outside her will, you have voided the authority you carry. Talk to me, somebody. Which is why we must live holy. We don't get saved by living holy. But our living holy keeps us in his will. It means we have his nature in us. The Bible says he that has the nature of God cannot sin. Talk to me, somebody. So when we stand in his name and we come to God, God doesn't deal with us as who we are. He deals with us based on his relationship with Christ. And the first step to that is propitiation for sin. The word propitiation is very different from what we understand. Now, whenever you say, Lord, forgive me, you know, I'm sorry. You said not to go to my boyfriend's house and I did. Fill in the blanks. Um, am I in trouble? Okay, fill in the blanks. So he goes, Lord, I'm sorry. He said, I shouldn't go to my girlfriend's house, and I did. I'm sorry. He said, I shouldn't do this, and I did. Now, we think what happens is God says, okay, you know what? It's okay. Don't do it again. That's not what happens. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? It's death. Every time you sin, someone has to die. Hear me closely. Every sin... Every act of sin, some of you are thinking, yay, what's my life expectancy now? Every act of sin is punishable by death. The word wages is not, see, wages is a very strong word. Wages means salary, right? It means what you are worth. When someone gives you wages, they're not being nice to you, right? They're paying you what you deserve. The wages of sin is death. And so in the Old Testament, every time someone sinned, an animal had to die. It was you or the animal. Talk to me. Hello. It was you or the animal. But something innocent or something with blood, sorry. Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now, why blood? The Bible says the life of the soul is in the blood. That's why when a person bleeds to death or when a person loses too much blood, they die. Because contrary to science, you're not a robot made up of certain parts and nerves and, and, and whatever. There is a spirit in man, the Bible says. There is a life source, and that life source is contained in blood. Which is why when a person dies, their blood... What happens to their blood? Doctors, talk to me. When you cut a corpse, do they bleed? When a corpse has been dead long enough, do they bleed? 
No, because something has left the blood. Now, the old, the, the, old, the old Christian fathers used to teach this, and I don't know that it's true, but I don't know that it's not. That when Adam was alive, before he fell, he didn't have blood. He had the glory of God flowing through his veins. And that it was when he fell that the glory congealed into what we call blood. And the only reason why I don't necessarily disprove that is when you study the scientific properties of blood, it's very similar to light. Those of you who watch CSI Miami, that's why they use certain things to, you know, you get what I'm trying to say? Blood actually has the same characteristics as light. But now, whether or not that's true, it's not in the Bible we carry, so I don't know, so I ain't going to preach it. But whatever it is, that blood carried life. And so when that animal died and its blood was shed, a life paid for your iniquity. The first sin was paid for by the life of Christ as the lamb in the garden from the foundation of the world. And it's the same ever since. Propitiation means payment. Now, if you get this, you won't sin so easily. It means payment. It means something has to be paid. God is a loving God, but he's a just God. If he let sin go unpunished, he would fail to be just. So there must be a punishment. There must be a ransom. There must be a sacrifice. Something has to die for every lie you, call, every lie you tell. Now, this is the good news for you start getting funny. See, the good news is our high priest died 2,000 years ago. And he paid the price, the Bible says, that because he was so valuable. Now, what's the price of a thing? The value you pay for it, right? Now, he was so valuable that his death didn't just deal with one sin. It dealt with sin forever, past, present, and forever future. That was the value of his, because he was God himself. The life of God was worth a lot more than the life of bulls and rams. The Bible says if the sacrifices of bulls and rams brought, or brought remission of sins, how much more when God hung himself and put himself on an altar? So every time you sin and Satan comes to collect, uh, the Bible says that uh, death is a spirit. That's what you need to understand. Death is a, death is a personality. Every time, every time death comes before God and says, hey, Samantha just told a lie, Jesus shows up and says, Father paid for. The only reason you get off scot free is not because God just decided just to pat you on the back and say, don't do it again. No, someone died. And that's what the Bible says when we sin presumptuously, when we intentionally plan to sin, it says we crucify him again. What, we're, we're reenacting, we're re-invoking the pain and the agony he felt on the cross. And that's why it's a very, very, very dangerous thing the Bible says to fall into the hands of of a living God or an angry God. Because hell is the place where all the people who negated the sacrifice of Christ are going. That's why hell is so horrible. Not because God is so mean. The reason why they're going to be in hell forever is God is going to say, I died for you. I paid my life for you. And you turned your back. Hello. I like the quiet. I like the silent. So the first thing a high priest does is make propitiation for sin. And the value of the forgiveness paid for is tied to the value of the sacrifice and of the high priest's relationship with God. So if the priest was not right with God, there'd be trouble. If the animal had a blemish or a spot, there would be trouble. It had to be, at that point in time, a perfect priest and a perfect sacrifice. Our high priest was both the priest and the sacrifice. And because he was God himself, are you with me? And the Bible says it is impossible for God to deny himself. So it does not matter what you did Hear me closely. We have now therefore no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. Not because we know Christ Jesus. Listen to me. There is now therefore no condemnation. Why? To those who are aware with know him. No, 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 no. When we are in him, God says two things. First of all, you are the sacrifice on the altar. 
Because when he died, you if I, oh Lord have mercy. The Bible says when we died, when he died, we died with him. When he was rose, he risen. We, we were, when he was buried, we were buried with him. When he was risen, we rose with him. When, when you give your life to Christ, when you accept the work of Calvary, you identify with Christ. So you are in him but it is in him that you live you move and you have your being you are seated where in him far above now it's not with him or by him or so it's where in him so when god sees you he sees you on calvary as the sacrifice and above all when he sees you he sees you as the priest so because you are in christ jesus there is no condemnation and in the greek no means no nothing you can ever do Someone saying nothing. nothing. There is no sin you can commit. Oh, but Pastor, the Bible talks about the sin of, of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. What is that sin? The Bible says when it happens, your, your conscience is seared. The very fact that you're worried about it means you've not committed it. Can I say that again? The very fact that you're worried about sinning against the Holy Ghost means you haven't committed it. Because if you did, you wouldn't even be worried. That's where Satan is right now. His conscience is seared. His conscience is dead. When I was 10 years old, I told God one day, I said, God, just give me five minutes with Satan. I'll get him saved. I said, God, all this war between heaven and, earth and hell and blah, 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 is not necessary. I said, obviously, nobody has sat Satan down and preached the gospel to him properly. So I said, God, just <laughs> I said, God give me five minutes with this bad boy. I'll solve this whole problem. And we can all be happy and friends. Amen. As I grew older, I realized it wasn't going to happen anytime soon because his conscience is seared. But while you still have, and this is why there's no hope. The minute your conscience is seared, you no longer have the capability to respond to the sacrifice of Christ. That's the only reason why there's no forgiveness for that sin. But while you want forgiveness, there is nothing you can do. And I say nothing. Murder, rape, pedophilia. I hate all these things. Every time I see a pedophile, I want to kill them. But God reminds me, son, my sacrifice. My, in fact, if there is anything you cannot forgive a person, this is why malice is such a sin. Whenever you withhold forgiveness for anything to a person, you are telling God his blood wasn't worth what they did. Because if God could forgive us for killing his own son, Hello? Wherever you, you know, see, many times we, we camouflage, Paul, just give me a hand on the keyboard. We, we, we camouflage pride as humility, as purity. Oh, God, I don't know why I did it. Ah, God, you can't. And so for, for one week, you're beating yourself. You know, you know, you know it's, it's, it's not humility. It's not purity. It's pride. Let me explain. What you are telling God is, God, my standards are higher than yours. Hello? It is, not, it is not spiritual to not be able to pray for five days because you sinned. And then when you think you've beaten yourself badly enough, then you say, okay, now I can come to God. You know, we, 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 we seem to think we are the custodians of, of, of forgiveness. Amen? Even for... See, uh, when you don't forgive yourself, what you are telling God is, God, you lied. Hello. You're saying is the sacrifice of Calvary, the priest wasn't pure enough. The sacrifice wasn't acceptable enough. Do you know how much of an insult that is to God? Do you know how much of an insult that is to God? Okay, let's keep going to the book of Hebrews. So as a priest, the first thing he is, is he's a merciful priest, right? Somebody say merciful. So his nature of his mercy, you must understand that about your priest. And it is because he is unfaithful. What, what does it mean to be faithful? What does it mean to be faithful? The Bible talks about faithful stewards, faithful servants, right? When you say somebody is faithful, what does it mean? It means they are committed beyond reproach. Does that make sense? When somebody is faithful, it means they are committed beyond reproach. They are committed beyond recovery. They have sold themselves to a cause. A faithful servant is one whom you know, come hell or high water, come rain or shine, he's going to do what you told him to do, right? Now, he is not just merciful. He is faithful in his mercy. And you must understand this. Now, this is the difference between a prophet and a priest. A prophet and a priest are very similar. The difference is a prophet is primarily God's representative. So a prophet works for God. That's why prophets are angry people. That's why they are very strange people. Because they are literally carrying the entire weight of God's emotions. 
but a priest works for the people can i say that again a prophet is god's lawyer a priest is the people's lawyer they both connect god and man but from two different angles a priest is concerned about the well-being of the people before god the prophet is concerned about the well-being of god and many of us don't know we hurt god sometimes Many of us don't know we injure God, we, 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 we steal from him. Many of us don't know that we have the capability to rob God. We have the capability to put God in a position where he doesn't enjoy his day. So a priest wants you happy, a prophet wants God happy. So if a priest is faithful, who is he faithful to? To us. Bible says there is no priest found faithful in all the house. So the priest came from the house, right? So he is faithful to us. Now you must understand this. Whenever now Job's problem when he was attacked was there was a there was a there was a conference in heaven and he didn't have an attorney. God and Satan had a conversation concerning Job, and there was nobody to speak for Job. Amen. So when Job woke up in the morning, the thing had been decided over his head. The Bible says we have a faithful and merciful high priest. Understand this, the sec- or not even the second person. There is a person now in heaven. In fact, the one whose opinion matters the most in heaven is your priest. The one who has the veto in heaven. The one who has the final say. The one with the name above every other name is your priest. And he's not just your priest, he's a man. The Bible calls him the man Jesus. So now there is somebody in heaven fighting the cause of man. Talk to me. I come from a country when, when they form government, every state, every region wants to make sure they have a minister in government. Because if you don't have somebody from government or somebody from your place in government, nothing's going to be done for you. They ain't going to build your roads. They ain't going to repair your schools. They ain't going to give you anything. So people will refuse to vote for the person they know is the best for the job because they want to vote for their own person because they know when their own person gets the government, he'll look after their interests. You understand what I'm talking about now? We have our own person. Tell your neighbor we have our own person. Our elder brother from our own house is on the council of heaven. And every time there is a decision to be taken concerning the earth, he says, hey, hey, excuse me, excuse me, please, excuse me, please. Hey, you know my people are down there. You understand what I'm talking about? Every time there is, a, there is a, an esoteric or a spiritual meeting in the heavens, because many of us don't know Satan has access to the, to the throne of God. Why? Because in the accuser of the brethren, He's the he's the he's the law is the is the prosecuting lawyer. He has access to the throne room of God. The Bible says he accuses us before the throne of God. So I say before. At the very throne of God, day and night, while you're sleeping, while you're eating, while you're doing everything, he's there reading the charges against you. But thank God we have a priest, we have an attorney, we also want to say, Father paid for. So thank God, if he wasn't merciful, we'd be dead by now. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Let's, let's, we're, we're almost there, we're almost there. Now come with me, Let, let's take a trip. I said we're taking a trip through Hebrews. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Rabban Doria Kasaya. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly call. With brethren... Holiness is not the absence of sin, it's the nature of God. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle. The word apostle means sent one, it means one with a specific assignment. But look, apostle and high priest of our of our what? Oh, talk to me, church, this morning. Of our what? What is he the high priest of? Let's keep reading. Who was faithful to him who appointed him? as Moses was also faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which should be spoken of afterward, but Christ as a son over his own house. Ah, Jesus, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope from sin. Let's, let's, let's do this backwards. First of all, the house is us. Look at this. The house is us. 
God's house is us. Amen? It says whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence. So the house we're talking about is the house of faith. But look at this. Moses was... Now, we all know Aaron was the high priest in his day, but he was just an extension of Moses, really. The Bible says Moses was the God, Aaron was, the, Aaron was his prophet. God compares Jesus with Moses. He says Moses was faithful as a servant. Somebody say servant. Jesus, I wish you could get this. Ah, no, 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 no. Paul, play me some strings. Moses was faithful as a servant. Now, you and I know very well servants have limitations. Servants don't have a say in how things run. But the Bible says he had a level of glory. Enough glory to stand between God and some people and say, God, if you want to destroy them, go through me. And God said, Moses, because you're standing there, I'm going to leave them alone. And that was a servant. A servant taught God something. The Bible says God repented of the evil he was going to do. A servant prayed on behalf of three million people. And God forgave three million people of, 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 of idolatry, of calling a golden calf Yehoah. Jews are so particular about that name that they don't write it with the vowels and when they write it they use a fresh pen. That name is sacred. They called that calf Jehovah. That's why God was so angry. But when Moses stood with a censer between the living and the dead when the plague was shown, the Bible says God stopped and that was a servant. How much more the son? If a servant, oh God have mercy, if a servant could part the Red Sea, and three million people walk through on dry ground. If a servant could pray and manna fell from heaven, if a servant could take care of three million people for 40 years in the wilderness, the Bible says their clothes did not wither, their shoes were not messed up, there was none sick or feeble among them. That was a servant. You and I, or you and I, have access to the son, not the servant. The one who the Bible says has more glory. The one standing between the wrath of God and you now is not Moses any longer. It's God himself. And if Moses was so successful, if Moses was so bad and all that, if Moses achieved all he did, you know, ah, come on somebody. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? You have God himself saying, Lord, if you kill them, go through me. When you need food, you don't have Moses praying for you. <laughs> you have God himself saying, Father, by my sacrifice, all things pertaining to life and godliness are now theirs. But the Bible says he is the high priest of what? Let me stop here today. I'll, I'll, I'll continue next week or whenever. He's the high priest of what? Your what? Your what? Your what? What is he the high priest of? The same way Israelites brought rams and animals and bulls to their high priest. And based on what they brought to him, he took it before the Father or before God and said, God, look at the sacrifices they brought. The Bible says, let us now therefore offer the sacrifice of what? Sacrifice of what? The sacrifice of what? Talk to me. Sacrifice of praise. The fruit of what? Of our what? Let us offer the sacrifice of what? Of praise. That's why I keep telling you, stop being depressed. Stop looking morose. Stop acting like your world is falling apart. Stop looking like you took a bath with pickle juice. Because it's the sacrifice of what? Praise that gets you in to the courts of God. The fruit of what? Of our lips. The things we say. God, Peter told Cornelius, or the angel told Cornelius, your giving and your prayer have ascended to God. As a memorial speaking for you now when you do certain things when you give but most importantly when you speak in prayer you're not just firing words into the atmosphere you are handing over your request to a high priest and he takes those confessions and comes before God and says God I your care needs a new car and God says because I your care didn't come by herself because I came oh. It's like God is coming to God. And the Bible says he cannot deny himself. He's the high priest of your... That's why you've got to be careful what you say. Oh, my life is just messed up. I don't know what's going on. And you, shut up. Say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The lines are falling from me in good places. I have a great inheritance. Oh, man, there is makura babasata. Say, I am the righteousness. I'm not a sinner who fell down and got up. No, no, no. Donnie, I'm sorry. 
Donnie, I'm sorry. I'm not a sinner who fell or got up. I love you, Donnie. But I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am dead to sin. Sin has no hold over me. He became my peace. He, he who knew no sin became sin. The Son of God became the Son of Man. That I, the Son of a Man, could become the Son of God. He's my elder brother. He's Esau. When I show up in heaven with his hair, with his garment, when I go and do what he did, when I bring the Father the same sacrifice, he brought the Father. What was that sacrifice? Romans chapter 12. What does it say? What does it say? Romans chapter 12. Come on, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Present your what? Present your what? What was the sacrifice Christ presented? His body. Present your body a living sacrifice. Now he was a dead sacrifice, but you are a living sacrifice. When God is saying, I don't want you dead physically, but I want you to bring yourself, your nature, your will, your understanding, your processes, your mindset, your paradigms, your life source, everything that makes you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. And this is your reasonable, the Bible calls it act of worship or reasonable sacrifice. When you do that, like Jacob, you have brought what Esau normally he brings for the Father. And when you show up in the courtroom of heaven, the Bible says, oh God, have mercy. The voice, the voice, the voice, the voice is like Jacob. I can hear Samantha praying. But when I open my eyes, I see Jesus in front of me. You can sound how you want. But when you come in his name, let me work this a bit more. Oh, yeah, da, da, ba, 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 ba. Bible says death and life are the power of the tongue. The words that who speaks? Who speaks? Who is I? Who is I? Who is I? Who was I in the, in the verse? Jesus, right? The words that I speak are spirit and what? Are life. Stop talking. Take your word. When you speak, you are, oh, see, when I stand here and I declare, I'm not speaking as me. No, 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 no. I am in him. It is in him that I live and I move and I have my being. So when I open my mouth, Christ opens his mouth because he is the high priest of my confession. So he takes what I say, he goes to God and he repeats it verbatim. And God says, because you are the one asking, I got to do it. Few more scriptures, few more scriptures. Are you still there? Oh, are you still there? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Mama, 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 sande de bokora ba satala bahaya. So when you pray, understand this, you're not just doing religious rhetoric. It's not the thing you do in the morning so your day doesn't go bad. You have a what? A high priest. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4. This is good. This is good. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. If you're standing, you might as well keep standing because you might not be sitting down much longer. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Jesus. The Bible says, seeing then that we have a what? First, he is merciful, then he is faithful, then he's an apostle, now he is. So your high priest ain't some measly, smizzly, kizzly guy. He's not some low-level attorney who's trying to make a living in the legal world. He's not some guy who got his LLB degree yesterday. No, this is a great, somebody say great. This is a great and important, this is a high priest whose word is law. You know, even in the legal world today, when you are in real trouble, you pay money for some lawyers. Because there's some lawyers who, when they appear in any court, by virtue of their, if they don't take just any case, because it's almost assured that if this lawyer represents you, it's over. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Let me deal with that. Oh, la la la, just take it down, just a teeny weeny bit. He's passed through what? He's passed through what? What are the heavens? The first heaven is the atmosphere, right? The third heaven, according to Paul, is the seat of God. The second heaven is where the Bible says principalities and powers and spiritual wickednesses in heavenly places rule and operate. But this high priest, hey, Kanamando Saya, has passed through. Hey, hey, hey! His jurisdiction extends from the third heavens down to the first. So even that second heaven, even the place where the devil thinks he has authority, even in the grave, the Bible says Jesus is Lord. So the Bible says that you would rend the heavens, that you would tear, because fine, we have God in the third heavens, we have us just beneath the first, but there's that, 
that, that oh god help me i was going to say foolish there's that rebellious space called the second heavens that keeps causing trouble the bible says god will rend the heavens he will tear a hole that will extend from the third to the first so that what he wants to send to the earth can get through unfettered unchecked he said he's a high priest who has passed when he was ascending from the earth to god's throne he had to pass through the heavens the bible says oh jesus when he rose from the dead it said the trumpet sounded and there was a voice from heaven saying let all the angels worship him what lucifer and all the other fallen angels forgot was they were still angels so when that voice spoke even the devil himself even the demon of depression all those principalities and rulers had to worship him the principality over your village the one that you say has been disturbing your life for so long that's why you can't get married that angel worshiped a high priest he passed through he so he passed through hey 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 i wish i could explain this he wanted to get to god and the second heavens could not stop him where are you now so when you want to get to god how dare a spirit of depression how dare something tell you well you know the heavens are brass i can't no 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 my high priest passed through he led captivity captive he 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 gave gifts to men he 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 opened the way the bible says we can therefore come boldly no 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 i'm not coming cr- no, no, i'm coming boldly so i say boldly. boldly i'm walking through a dark alley at midnight but because i know i've got my seven foot two brother behind me i'm walking boldly come on somebody i know there's guys there who want to rape me but i'm walking boldly I, oh i'm a man united fan walking in liverpool on a day where we beat them but because i've got two rottweiler dogs on my chain i'm walking boldly they can look at me they can hit me all they want i know they want to kill me but they have no access to me why because i've got support so let's say i've got backup i've got backup now you don't have a rottweiler you don't have a seven foot brother you have the king of kings and the lord of lords the lion of the tribe of judah the one who spoke captivity and led it captive and so you too can pass you too can pass through the heavens tell anybody you can pass through the heavens oh i pass through the heavens every day i i wouldn't be alive if i couldn't pass through the heavens i have access in the heavens Amen. I can ascend and descend in humility in my place as a junior brother. When I need things done, I can step behind the veil and I can push certain buttons. I can be stood here in Nottingham and something's going on in Bulawayo in South Africa. And because I have access to the high priest, I can ascend. Somebody say ascend. I can pass through the heavens. I can stop stuff. I can say you stop, stop there. You keep and I leave this. Okay, blessing drop. Amen. Well, let's keep going. Oh, I wish I had a... The one day I swear I don't have a face towel. This ain't fair. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, now the Bible takes it deeper. The Son of God. Hey! The word Son means one after the likeness of. It means mature. It means heos. It means the one who has come into the same level of maturity as his father. It's not, this is not technon. But the Bible says, now beloved, we are the sons of God. No, 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 no. We are sons. But he is the son. He is the fullness of the manifestation of his father. But he goes on to say, let us hold fast our what? Our what? Let us hold fast our what? Our what? Now, what's your job in this process? You got a bad boy fighting on your account, but you got something to do. Your job is to hold fast. Now, you can't hold fast to something you never had. Hello. It means you must have first had a confession. Talk to me. Now, when you got saved, let me break that prayer down to you. You said, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my and that was your confession savior means he has delivered you from the power of sin and death that includes poverty demonic affliction sickness disease everything sin had over you was broken at that confession the other confession was lord that's the one we don't like 
it means he owns you. Look at him and say he owns you. Say he's your landlord. See, this thing we call flesh came from dust, right? So this is land. Tell me about this is land. He's the landlord. Meaning he calls the shots. The Bible says we must because he is a high priest. If we want access to the benefits of the high priest, we must hold fast. Meaning nothing must make us waver from the confession that he is Savior and Lord. And the next part of the verse, the next part of the verse makes it very clear why it says that. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are. Meaning all the things that could have made you turn. Mm -mm. Get this, get this, get this, get this. The only reason why Jesus had to send Peter to get gold from the mouth of a fish was so he could tell you one day that he too had a need he didn't have money for. He fed, clothed, and took care of three men and paid their taxes. Or fed 12 men, sorry, and paid their taxes for three and a half years. You think he was broke? Bible says when he died that he had a dress, a seamless dress. It was woven from top, there was no, there was no seam, sorry, from top to bottom. It was made from one piece of material. It was so expensive that even when it was bloodied, even when he bled on it, the soldiers still fought and gambled for it. Jesus wasn't broke. Bible says two men came to him and asked him to show him where he lived and he took them. People say he didn't have a house. Now, foxes have, he have, have uh, birds have nests, foxes have holes. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. That wasn't talking about a physical house. Jesus didn't sleep rough on the road to lay his head. Where, what's your head? What's the head? The place of authority, the place of thinking, the place of vision. Jesus was saying there is, I can't find any place that I'm comfortable laying my head. You didn't get that. It means there's nobody who thinks like I think. There's nobody who can carry my authority, carry my vision, carry my mind process. But he said, you know what? So these guys don't tell me that, they weren't bro that I wasn't broke, right? So there was a need. He didn't have money to pay the need. And he demonstrated how we must react when we have a need we don't have the means to pay. So we didn't say, well, Jesus, you know what? You didn't understand how it was like to be a young man in today's world with all the pornography going on around and all the, the sexual whatever. The Bible says his friends were sinners, come on, and prostitutes. A prost an ex -pro oh, come on hear this an ex prostitute kissed his feet and wiped it with her hair talk to me somebody it's quiet up in this place if you're a grown man you know what I'm talking about when a woman starts to touch your feet hello come on Bible says he was in all points tempted he went through everything. Bible says he endured the contradiction of sinners. He, he, he put himself at the mercy of everything. Like Dom Wen said, he walked where you walk. He stood where you stand. He felt what you feel. He understands. But in spite of his understanding, he says, hold fast the confession of your faith. Because I am the high priest of your confession. I can't work without it. So when we come to God in prayer, the Bible says angels excel in strength and they hearken unto the word of the Lord. Heaven is at attention, waiting to see what goes on. The high priest is stationed. Let's go. The angels are ready. And then we say, God, I don't know what's going on. I love you, don't mess up. I can see Jesus going. The angels are like, oh boy. Okay, let's take it to God. So Jesus goes to the Father. God, he doesn't know why his life is all messed up. God says he'll soon find out. So Jesus comes back. You know, and many times the answers we get in prayer are functions of the questions we ask. The reason why God only ever comforts you is because he's a good God. Your prayer was useless, so he might as well comfort you. So for many people, prayer is just a place of receiving comfort and, and you know, and succor. Right? Prayer is just a place where when we pray, we feel better. True? So I feel peace. But peace is only a part of the, a part of the equation, a part of the puzzle. Bible says, let us hold fast unto the confession of our faith. But I ain't done yet. Come on. Two more scriptures and I'm gone. 
Can you handle two more scriptures? Are you sure? Pray that my iPad doesn't die. I've got two percent left. Maraba sandere yosaya. Oh sharabandare yako sandere do sadada basaya. Jesus, Jesus. Yetarada shande ikonda ya. Okay, let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter five. The Hebrews chapter five, from verse one. For every high priest taken from men is ordained for who? You know, I told you that the high priest is for man, not for God. The prophet is for God. The high priest is for man. Every high priest taken from among men, he has to be taken from among men. He has to be somebody who can be touched by the infirmities of man in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and... Let's stop for a second there. Both what? And both and... The sacrifice is simple, isn't it? What are the gifts? Hello. When, when the angel came to Cornelius, what did he tell him? What two things are sent before God? Your giving and your... Even our giving is only effective because it's going through a high priest. The Bible says high priests are ordained to minister to men and to receive tithes of them. And then the Bible says in the next chapter, chapter 6, about Melchizedek, it says Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. What did Melchizedek do? Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He said, blessed be Abraham, or, and blessed be the God of heaven, or the possessor of heaven and earth. And the Bible says as a response to the blessing, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. Right? And in so doing, sealed his future. When you bring offerings and tithe to the house of God, the only hope you have that it is one, accepted in the first place, and two, worthy of a reward, is because you are putting it in the hands of a high priest. You understand what I'm saying? And the same with the high priest in those days would take the sacrifice of men and offer it, and when God accepted it, there'd be a blessing. You know that if you... Oh, you know that if he is alive and if he is who he says he is and you are acceptable to him every penny every dime every sacrifice every time because money isn't the only thing you give everything you offer to God must go through Christ if it doesn't go through Christ it is not acceptable oh I mean, eesh. Bible says sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God you can't live like the devil and then sign a check once a week and think God just, you know, no, 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 no. It's quiet now. Nobody shouts any longer. Agatha, help me out. They're keeping quiet on me. He's a high priest of your gifts and your sacrifices. Ah, uh, ma, 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 say and day. This is very important to me. You know why? <laughs> because I've been giving some crazy gifts recently. I've been making some sacrifices recently that I've been pinching. And I'm like, God, you better be in this. Have you done that before? Where you make a, you make a sacrifice and say, God, this better be you. Because if it is not you, I'm finished. And God reminds me and says, son, don't worry. You didn't just put the money on the, on the altar. You didn't just give the keys, whatever. You put it in the hands of a high priest. When you come to church and you pay your tithe and your offering, people say, well, you know, my church, my pastor steals the money. That's between him and God. You just obey. You're not bringing it to a man. You're not bringing it to a building. You're not bringing it to, to buy equipment. You're not bringing it to pay bills. You're not bringing it to pay salaries. You are giving it to God. Like Cornelius, the Bible says it ascends before God as a sweet smelling savor. It's an aroma before God because your high priest takes your money, takes your cars, takes your whatever you give, takes it to God and says, Father, look. Hello. Let me move away from this one before I get into trouble. Oh, Jesus. Maraba and Doroshe. One more scripture. How are we doing for time? Oh, Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 1. Hebrews chapter 5. We worship you. Mm. 
Para pa ang durias na mahal di ay. <sighs> Which one do I go with now, Lord? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20 says, Where the foreigner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I've just explained that. He's our foreigner. Somebody say foreigner. He goes, to, when the Bible says he's going to heaven to prepare a place for us, it doesn't mean he's going to build bricks and stones. He's a foreigner. He's going to clear, a, he's going to make sure that heaven is expecting us. He's going to prepare our place of authority, but I don't have time for that. Now, verse chapter 7, verse 26, Hebrews 7, 26 says, For such a high priest became, or for such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. I've spoken about that. He became us, that we might become him. Who is he? Holy. Hebrews 7, 26, harmless undefiled separate from sinners made higher than the heavens who doesn't need as other high priest to offer up sacrifice daily blah 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 we've spoken about that that his sacrifice was more than the sacrifice of bulls and rams now i'm going to stop at verse 8 verse 8 and there's that's a stop at verse chapter sorry, chapter 8 verse 1 stand up everybody let's close let's close let's close hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 now i want us to read this together as we close this is this is beautiful this is beautiful this is beautiful now paul has been speaking in hebrews about the high priest right he, he's faithful he's merciful he's good he's great he's a this he's a that in chapter 8 paul says now of the things we have spoken this is the sum someone say this is the sum I meaning this is the summary of all we've said this is the short form this is if you, if you didn't hear anything else i've spoken for the last 45 minutes hear this we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand on the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the lord has pitched and not man for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices wherefore it is of necessity that he should have something to offer meaning he needed to have something to offer let me read this in the, in the translation you can understand all this king james english hebrews chapter 8 let's look at this let's look at this oh god i i just i just want to i want to pop out of my skin right now if you could just get this i just wish you could see this now this is the main point of the things we were saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens now our high priest is sat down at the right hand the bible says in the book of psalms the lord said unto my lord sit down at my right hand until your enemies have been made your footstool now your high priest has an instruction to keep sitting till his enemy now who are his enemies who, who are his enemies it is in him that you and you and you have your the bible says he will contend with those that contend with his enemies are yours now you are sat in him at the right hand of the majesty of the heavens of the heavens meaning this majesty has control over first second and third and your high priest is sat down cool relaxed ain't no stress see jesus and satan aren't involved in this boxing match satan doesn't throw a punch then they go Ugh. no 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 jesus is sat there's no contest there's no struggle there is no there is no andaramando kora basata there is no what's the word help me somebody there's there's no point of reference satan is not in his class satan's a puppet on a string satan's a toothless bulldog walking around seeking whom to devour but the only people he has access to are those who are outside christ now the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle with the lord erected not man every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and keep playing and sacrifices therefore it is necessary that this one has something to offer i've just i've spoken to you about that we need to give him our confession and our gifts our lifestyle so everything we do obedience prayer giving these are the things we give to him to offer right it goes on to say if we were on the earth he would not be a priest since they are priests who offer gifts according to the law who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things verse 6 but now he has obtained a more excellent somebody say excellent ministry in as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant somebody say better covenant which was a
established on better promises if the first covenant had been faultless there would have been no place for the second but because he saw fault with the first he says behold the days are coming said the lord i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and the house of jacob i could go on and on and on but the bible says he is the mediator now the book of hebrews goes on to say further on that there is for a covenant to be ratified there must be the death of the testator say testator somebody needs to die for a will to be put in effect right a will is only valid while the person is dead my will can work while i'm alive so don't kill me anytime soon because i haven't written it you won't get anything you might want to make wait till i'm a billionaire till i have money to leave you if you kill me now with stress and nothing for you but the bible says at the death of a testator he becomes the mediator now what is a mediator a mediator is a man who stands between two men can i have two of you pastor okay and pastor shepherd so now they have an agreement right the bible says that men verily swear by a greater and that at an oath all contradiction is laid to rest so you guys have an agreement right you want to make sure that you keep your agreement so you call a mediator the mediator must oh the mediator has to have authority over both of you it has to be somebody who both of you see as having jurisdiction so that if one of you tries to default on the agreement you swear by the mediator so you say by pastor limide don't say that please but by pastor limide basically so if you default on your agreement you are giving pastor limide the authority to judge you right the bible says when god looked around and he searched everywhere he found no one greater so he swore by himself now he didn't swear by himself the father he swore by himself in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god that's what the bible says god has exalted his word doesn't just mean he's verbal See, the things god speaks are just a manifestation of the word the same way sins are a manifestation of sin words are a manifestation of the word he exalted his word the pre-incarnate christ are you with me the one in john chapter 1 verse 1 above all his name when he died the bible said now therefore was given to him a name above every other now i present to you jehovah is a name Jehovah is not just a word, it is a name, meaning it's an authority, it is a position, it is a form of jurisdiction. But God took the name Yeshua, he said, and exalted it above his own name. Why? So he could be a mediator between him and you. So God is saying, if I break my covenant with you, there is somebody who, uh, God, the Bible says, if we overcome, God will vacate his Listen to me. The Bible says, when we overcome, Christ will give us his throne right as the father gave him his throne do you understand what i'm saying when jesus ascended into heaven god said now boy now you're old enough now you're a man i turn over the company to you i don't make the decisions in heaven any longer christ does the one who calls the shots is now the mediator between the father and the church even if the father were if, if god woke up one day on the bad side of his bed if god woke up one day had too much wine you know and decided that you know what he wasn't going to keep his word any longer when god makes you a promise that is a mediator <laughs> say father you said you said you promised you oh god have mercy see this, this is why i brought both of them out remember a few weeks ago a few months ago i was i was preaching in church and the spirit of prophecy hit me and i walked with the pastor shepherds and i said god was about to bless him with a car and then god spoke to me and said you do it right now what he doesn't know is he has a mediator I have somebody in my own house who wouldn't let me rest until you get your car right so even if i thought you know what god well maybe i just spoke it anyhow no 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 you have a mediator so if i just do it this way you have a mediator right you have somebody who keeps talking about you keeps asking after you so even if i'm offended with you even if i get angry with you even if you offend me see, even if you if you were to walk out of this place and go on tbn and slander me somebody was a witness who has authority or at least has jurisdiction over me and because she 
is your mediator you will get it in the same way christ is our mediator of a better covenant now before you understand the word better look at the first covenant you can sit down look at the first covenant look at the one that the bible says was worse look at all the things that happened under the first covenant come on somebody the sun was brought back the red sea opened the bible said fish came from the sky manna came from nowhere people lived moses lived to 120 and the bible says his eyesight was not dim that's why see i'm never going to need glasses hear me i am never going to need glasses and that's why when i started losing my hair i went to a mirror and i said god you said amen that the spirit of life in christ jesus has set me free from the law sin and death boldness is a form of death i rebuke it when I'm 120, if I'm still alive, if God hasn't come yet, I'm still going to be jogging in the morning. I'm still going to be preaching the same way. I'm not going to, you know why? Because if the first covenant made provisions for that, see, all the things we quote in the Bible are from the first covenant. You will bless the Lord and, he will, and he, you will serve the Lord. He will bless your bread and your water and he'll take, see, that's old covenant. Do you understand? I shall not die, but live old covenant. I will pay my vows. I will decree a thing. It will be established old covenant. Now it says we have a bet. We have a better one, a more effective one, and we have a mediator who is working for us. He's on our payroll in, in, in that sense. It's an inside job. It's fixed. The election has been rigged in your favor. But if you don't understand, the book of Hebrews goes on in other chapters. It calls him the high priest of good things to come. Hey! He's the high priest of... So, uh, no, 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 you don't understand this. Satan, I don't care where I'm coming from. I don't care what has happened to me. I don't care what you've done to me. Because I have access. 